my name is Kai Mei Fu, and I'm an experimental physicist in the University of Washington Physics Department here. And I've been given the honor of introducing tonight's guest, um, David Weinland. Um, I'd first like to thank everyone for joining us for our fourth Frontiers in Physics public lecture. As you may know, this series was started to provide our community inspiring free lectures on the latest advances in physics given by the people who directly contributed to these advances. The broad range of topics that we have heard over the past two years mirror the broad impact that physics has on how we view the world and also how we impact and affect our world. In our last lecture, we learned from Dr. John Preskill how the spooky and non-intuitive nature of quantum mechanics may lead to unprecedented, unprecedented computational power. And in the spring, stay tuned, um, we will hear from leading particle theorist, Dr. Lisa Randall, who's well known for her work showing that extra dimensions can help solve some of the fundamental problems in physics. Today, we are excited for, to hear from Dr. David Weinland, our third Nobel laureate in this series, on his contributions to the measurement of time. Before introducing David, I would like to first take a moment to thank Dr. Patrick O'Hara and, and his wife, Dr. Katerina Randolph, who unfortunately can't be with us here tonight. Um, it was their vision to start this, this series. They approached our department thinking that what our community needed was a public lecture series bringing um, the public to, uh, to learn about what's happening in physics today. And because of their generosity, it has become a reality. I would also like to thank Phil Ekstrom, who wrote the program that you all now have on a, a short history of timekeeping. Phil was a PhD student of Hans Demolt and overlapped with David Weinland during his time as a postdoc at the University of Washington. Um, on, on that note, I would actually also like to add that if you're interested in getting involved in the physics department, we would love to hear from you. Um, there is contact information on the back of your program. Um, so in getting involved with physics can be attending a lecture. It can be getting added to an email list so you can hear about all the colloquium that we have and other public and outreach events that we have going on. And also, it can be helping to support our students, um, individual research projects, and outreach events that we have for our community. And so now on to the introduction. David Weinland, uh, he grew up in California and graduated from Berkeley with a bachelor's degree in physics. He then completed his PhD with Norman Ramsey before, at Harvard before joining us at the University of Washington for his postdoctoral work with our own Nobel laureate, Hans Nobel, or Hans Demolt. This was before, <laughs> this was before Norman Ramsey and Hans Demolt would later be awarded the 1989 Nobel Prize in Physics. And so if you could say one thing, you, you could say that David really knew how to choose an advisor since both of his advisors were chosen. Um, after leaving University of Washington, Dr. Weiland joined the now National Institutes of Standards and Technologies, and for the next decade, pioneered precision techniques to measure and control individual atoms. The main motivation for this work was precision timekeeping. But in 1995, there was a theoretical proposal uh, by Sirach and Zoller on a new way to um, to process information, quantum information processing with ions. And because of this very fundamental work on clocks that he had been performing, within months of that proposal, he was able to uh, demonstrate a quantum gate with single or two, two ions. Um, this, this seminal work, this high precision control, which led to his work in clocks and quantum information processing, was honored in 2012 with the Nobel Prize. Um, as, as some of you know, um, David Weinland uh, spent his postdoc here at University of Washington with, with Hans Demolt. And Hans Demolt passed away this past year. It is fitting that we're able to hear today about new scientific results that, in part, 
were influenced by Demel's work. Just as one day in the future we'll hear of discoveries that are enabled by David Weinland's work, which he'll discuss today. Thanks. Well, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Kaimi. And um, first of all, thanks for all of you coming. I mean, one of the, one of the nice things about giving these, this kind of lecture is to, to see the, the, you know, the large scale interest from the public. And so I, I can't teach you everything about what we do, but I hope to give you an impression of what we do and some of the simple ideas that will hopefully come across. So you can, you can see my outline there, what I'll talk about. And um, so I can start by saying, well, wh why, why are, what's the use of clocks? And throughout history, it, it's been uh, prim primarily for navigation. And that application uh, is still true today. Uh, so just going back on a little bit of time, I'm not a sailor, but any sailor will know what I'm talking about here. And the, the basic idea is uh, for navigation is you want to determine your, your latitude and longitude and, and therefore your position on the earth. And the, the easy part is, is the latitude where the basic idea is if there's some distant star, in this case, the, the, the North Star, uh, if you measure the angle of the the direction of the star relative to, you, to the, the, the level, the tangent uh, of, of the Earth, you can, you can de easily determine the latitude that, that you're at. But the, the harder part is uh, longitude, and there, there you need time, and the simple reason is because the Earth is rotating. So the, the principle is the same. You're gonna be looking at some distant star that's relatively speaking fixed in the in your view, and you determine where you are by measuring the angle between the, the star and the, and the tangent on Earth where you are. The problem is because the Earth is rotating, you need to know time uh, uh, to know exactly uh, you know, which, what the angle, how the angle corresponds to, to your, your position and longitude. And I'm not gonna, I won't go through the simple math uh, uh, the scientists out there will will understand this. The, and, but the idea is, you know, what are the errors due to the, the error in time? And just a, a simple example I, I show here, and the idea is that so a, a, a relative distance, say an error given by this, the error in the angle, uh, can be related to the error in time. And so this 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 section of of, of distance in in latitude is given by the simple formula here. And so the idea, of course, the, the, this angle is, is, is changing in time and uh, there's an imprecision given by the imprecision in time. So in this simple expression, we're, we're rotating at once per day, the radius of the earth is about 4,000 miles. And so for an error of one second in time, that gives a, a, a relative error in this in latitude position of about a, about a half a kilometer. And so uh, just a little history. Uh, there, there was, of course, sailors going back many centuries relied on uh, time to tell, to be able to navigate. And there was several incidents in the early uh, 1700s uh, where the, 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 the Brits lost uh, ships at sea. And so the British Parliament decided to sponsor a prize, the so-called Longitude Act. And the, the prize was given to someone who could demonstrate a, a, a clock which would allow navigation to about 30 nautical miles, which translated to an error in time of about, about two minutes. And there's a famous story, many of you may have read the book, there's a couple of good books about this, John Harrison who, who, who came up with a clock, it was actually like a large uh, pocket watch, it was a mechanical uh, uh, clock that, that he came up with and he was able to demonstrate that it was, it was within this, uh, uh, within the errors that, that, were, that were required by this, to win this prize and part of the story is that 
you know, the, 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 the parliament, re, you know, they wouldn't give him his money. And I think it was a couple decades before he finally, the king stepped in and, and got him his money. And then I think he died a year later or something like that. But, but anyway, it's a good story. There's a couple of good books. It's a good story to read. Uh, so, but of course, these days, we, the, the way we navigate is, is via GPS. We kind of take it for granted these days. And uh, the precisions can be much, much higher. And the, the basic idea there is that in the, in the, to give you the idea, you want to, you want to determine the, your distance from SEM satellite. And I, again, I won't go through the math, but the, the basic idea is that uh, if, the, because clocks are so precise, uh, they basically, you, you can think of a simple protocol. It's a little bit more complicated than this, but uh, if you agree that the satellite is, that first of all, your clocks have to be synchronized. And if, a, if the, you establish a protocol, say, where the satellite emits a pulse of radiation every second tick, then there'll be delay because of the speed of light uh, before it reaches you. And so to give you an idea of the precisions that are involved, uh, for, a, for an error in time of about a nanosecond, 10 to the minus nine seconds, that gives a, an error in distance here of about, about 30 centimeters. And where clocks come in is basically we, at least, we'd like the clocks to be a, autonomous at least over uh, extended periods. And so if we have an error of a, of a nanosecond over one day, that's a that, that corresponds to a relative frequency uncertainty of the clocks of about one part in 10 to the 14. And these are, these are the kind of numbers we're able to, to reach today. Uh, of course, it's a little bit more complicated to get, to get three-dimensional navigation. There's a network of satellites. And in fact, the, the system, there's, there's enough redundancy in the system that the, the satellites can not only know their position, but the, but the clock swoops can be synchronized together. Uh, so we can get three-dimensional position at, at this level of precision. So anyway, a bit about clocks. I think, we, I think most physicists' notion about time is very similar uh, to the non-scientists. And it's just, it's a, sort of a, a measure of the progression of events. And, uh, the basic idea of making a clock then is we have some periodic event generator and a counter, and with that then we can we can generate time. And traditional event generators are, of course, the rotation of the Earth, uh, and also later uh, the pendulum clocks were invented, and and the the precision was quite a bit better than than given by the by the rotation of the Earth. Uh, but that's that's basically it. So these days, though, we, 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 we think of using oscillations and atoms. And a simple picture you can think about is, say, a, an electron orbiting around the nucleus. That's a pretty good picture. Quantum mechanically, it's a little, it's a little bit more complicated. The, what we think about is, the, the, this, the, the, say, an or, electron orbiting around the nucleus. The quantum mechanics tells us that the, that the electron is not it can't, it can't be, uh, its position can't be precisely defined. But nevertheless, there's a, there's a very precise timing of, of the orbit of the electron around the nucleus. And this picture over here is meant to show a, a dipole where the electron is actually oscillating through the nucleus. But the, uh, but the, big, the basic idea then is that this, this, we, we establish this oscillation in the atom and the the key part is that, as the early quantum mechanics told us, is that, that atoms don't I exist in, in any uh, arbitrary kinetic energy state. There's a certain discrete energy levels associated with the electron orbiting around the nucleus. And the, what the, the, the basic idea is that the frequency of the oscillation is then given by uh, the energy difference between these two quantum states divided by Planck's constant. Yeah. So uh, one simple mode of, of using these oscillations is, a, is, a, is, an, is, is called a, a maser or a laser. And we're more familiar with the, with the laser. Actually, the, 
the first devices that operate on this principle were called Maser's M sensor microwave versus, versus light. And the, the simple picture is we have atoms that we stick them inside of a, a cavity which contains the radiation. We sample a little bit of that and then we have a counter to, to, to generate time. Uh, so a little bit of personal history. Uh, I was uh, a graduate student at, at Harvard uh, with Norman Ramsey, who's right here. And Norman and his colleague, Daniel Kleppner, uh, uh, had, had recently invented and demonstrated the first hydrogen maser. So the basic idea of what I, what I showed on the previous slide. Uh, so this was, the, this was the group in 1967. I started in 1965. That's me getting close to the boss there, you see. So, um, anyway, so uh, when, uh, Norman wanted to, to have precise measurements of, of all the hydrogen isotopes, the, the maser oscillation frequency of all the isotopes. So, I, so, so my project turned out to be to make a, a maser based on the deuterium isotope. And uh, the experiment wasn't any anything very astounding, but it taught, taught me a lot of nice techniques in atomic physics. And so this was the result of my thesis here. I'm probably the only one that has this number memorized, but and, um, anyway, so, but, but certainly what, what, what came into play all, all through my career and the things I'll talk about and, uh, that we did later was basically the, the, the name of the game here is there's Although the atoms are inside this cavity, there's various perturbations that they can go undergo. And so that one of the requirements is to pre precisely control the environment they're in. The other thing is that these, as they were radiating, the, the atoms live in so-called superposition states where they're radiating. And these, these superposition states were rather, actually rather long on the grand scale of superpositions. They lasted about a second. Uh, so that I give you, uh, there's another mode of operation. I showed you the laser or maser, maser mode of operation of a of a clock, and uh, the the other is where we actually say would would uh, again. Here's the energy structure, and what we do in this case is we 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 would apply radiation to, to atoms, say in a cell here, and basically we just look for the condition where the where the atoms absorb the radiation ma maximally, uh, then we know that the, the, the frequency of this oscillator is equal to the, to the frequency uh, given by the energy level separation. Uh, so the, a, a recipe for an atomic clock is, is very simple. Uh, the basic idea is we have some oscillator here which supplies radiation and, and in the previous example, we looked for the, for the, for the condition of this, the, the frequency of this oscillator where the absorption is maximum. And we can think of it, I won't describe the, the electronics here, but the, we can think of a simple servo system that feeds back, that, that forces the oscillator frequency to, to be equal to the frequency given by the energy difference. And when we reach that condition, the, uh, we just count cycles of the, of the oscillator. Now, in fact, it's, there's a little subtlety here is that uh, we get a we get a, a curve that registers the absor absorption. It's not infinitely narrow. There's uh, one of the uh, one of the reasons it's not is that the atoms in the excited state will decay, and that limits the resolution we have with this with this absorption feature. We say, and that so the only other ingredient to, to actually the way we work it is if if we sit right on the top, we're not very sensitive to small changes. With the top of this curve is is flat basically. So base all, the only difference that we do is we actually we do it in a stepwise fashion where we'll first probe on the on the uh, left side of the of this absorption feature, and then we'll step over to the other side and a probe on that side. And when we get an equal response, then we know that the mean of those two frequencies is equal to the, to the resonance frequency. So that's the only wrinkle beyond what I said before, but it's, it's actually no more complicated than that. So again, but a, a, a bit more common mode of operation, that was sort of for looking for continuous absorption. The, the way most clocks work is just slightly different. We, we basically, 
start the atom in the lowest energy level, and then we apply radiation for a, for a short time, and that's basically the same idea is that when the, when, the, when the radiation frequency of the oscillator is equal to the resonance frequency of the atom given by this expression here, then we, we, we know we're on resonance. And of course, we step from side to side of the absorption feature. And basically then to, to tell, uh, to measure this absorption, we just, ideally we could look at the maximum absorption uh, probability, of, but of course we step, step from side to side of the line. So it's just a slight difference from what I said before. So, well, why atomic clocks? And there's, there's a couple of strong reasons why atoms are nice. And what I, in, this, in this view graph, I'm going to compare to the pendulum clock, which actually is still a very, the, the a good pendulums are, are extremely good, almost as good as quartz crystals. But you can think of quartz crystals like they, they, they have the same, uh, uh, same conditions, uh, or some of the same conditions we have to worry about. But let's take the pendulum clock. So the, the frequency of a pendulum clock, is, as, as uh, st students in, in, in physics learn early in their, in their careers, is given by this, this simple formula where this is the acceleration of gravity and this is the, the length of the pendulum bob. Uh, and so what, what are the sensitivities? What, what can cause the frequency of the oscillation to, to change? And one is, say, temperature. The temperature is always can, is not precisely controlled and can be fluctuating. So what happens in this example of the pendulum is that most uh, suspension rods are a metal usually, and, and of course with temperature changes, the metals usually expand and contract as the temperature cools. And I, again, I won't go through the details of this, of this simple derivation, but the basic idea is that that, that even with materials of a very low expansion coefficients, this, so this represents the fractional change in the, in the length of the, of the pendulum uh, versus temperature, uh, we get to about, anyway, we work through this simple expression here and we get to sensitivity of, of uh, expressed fractionally of about, about a part in 10 to the eighth per degree C, uh, frequency change of, of the pendulum clock. Now, with atoms, what, what's nice is that we, we still have to worry about temperature effects. And actually, one of the more interesting one is, is due to Einstein. And that, that is the fact that typically in this container that we're holding the atoms, the, the atoms aren't at rest. They're moving around. And what Einstein ta told us was that, that, that uh, it, with, with two frames of reference that move relative to each other, time runs at a different rate. It's not, it's not just as simple as saying the clock here based on the atoms runs at a different rate. Actually, time runs at a different rate. So this was a, I mean, a, a, you know, a amazing revelation that, that, you know, changed our notion about, the, about, uh, about nature and it was due to Einstein. So anyway, but to give you an idea of the, the size of the effect, we do have to worry about this in our high precision clocks. And the, again, I won't go through the simple math here, but for a, a, a cesium atom, which has a mass of 133 mass units, uh, we, the, the frequency of the oscillation will change due to this relativistic time dilation, and, and the fractional change per, per degree C is given by, is about a part in 10 to the fifth eighth, so, so many orders of magnitude smaller sensitivity to temperature changes than this pendulum, and there's a simple, of course, we're more familiar these days with quartz crystals in our watches, but, but also in that case, the, the temperature sensitivity of those is quite a bit uh, larger than what we can get with atoms. Okay, so the other, other thing we have to think about is if we make different, if we realize different versions of the clock, uh, how reproducible are they? And of course, with a pendulum clock, uh, the, we have manufacturing tolerances to worry about the, the, the length of this pendulum for different, for different realizations can be different, which gives a different oscillation frequency. Of course, there can be wear, the pendulum, the, the bearing on the pendulum may wear a little bit, which will effectively lengthen the distance of the, of the, the, uh, the length of the pendulum, Bob. And, 
Uh, of course, it depends on the local value of gravity, which can change around the world and also fluctuates with, with earth tides and things like that. So the nice thing about atoms is that, that all atoms of a particular kind, as far as we know, so far they're, they're absolutely identical. So if we can agree on an atom to whose frequency we measure, uh, then we, in principle, can get exactly the same frequency within uh, these environmental perturbations that we have to worry about. And the other thing is atoms don't wear out. I mean, we, we can take the same atom and repeat this absorption process uh, in principle an infinite amount of times, and they, they, they preserve their properties throughout. So these days, actually starting uh, the first cesium clocks, which made the, measured the whole so-called hyperfine uh, transition at a frequency of about nine billion cycles per second. It was developed in the early 50s, and by the mid 50s, uh, by international agreement, we, we used that to the oscillations of the cesium hyperfine transition to define the second. And this definition still holds true today. Uh, what I'm going to show you is at least the performance of the clocks we can make now are better than we can, can realize with the, with the cesium, measuring the cesium transition. Of course, cesium was always getting better through the, the decades, so it was like a moving target. But we finally were able to overtake the performance about 10 years ago. So why a top optical a clocks? And, that one of the simple reasons it, is that the oscillation frequencies of electrons around the nucleus are much higher uh, than, the, than this so-called hyperfine transition. In this case, uh, compared to cesium, the oscillation of a, of a typical optical oscillation are about 100,000 times faster than the, than the oscillations of the, of the cesium clock. And so what that very, seem, means very simply is we get more ticks in any given uh, interval of time, say the second, so we can define that interval of, uh, divide that interval of time into finer and finer increments. So that's, that's the, the simple reason we, we want to think about high frequency. The other, the other thing is that for certain transitions, and I'll say a little bit more about that in, in a minute, these transitions, the, the, the frequency over which they absorb is, can be extremely narrow compared to the, to the actual frequency. So we get a very high relative precision. Uh, for, the case, for most of the cases I'll talk about, this, this width then, which is not infinitely narrow, is given by the, 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 the lifetime of the upper state in the transition. So is it a new idea? And the answer is no, and in fact, the, Actually, one of the, actually a colleague at, at, uh, in, at NIST in Boulder, he did some research and he published this paper in the early 70s and he dug up a text from uh, uh, Thompson, Ward Kelvin and his colleague Peter Tate. And they, in, their, in, their, in their paper, they, they acknowledged this idea was due to Maxwell, the kind of the inventor of the formalism of electromagnetism a long time ago. But anyway, the, the, what they, they wrote this, this, uh, this, uh, this couple of sentence, sentences here, and their, their idea was basically what we're talking about uh, with these atomic clocks. And they basically said, well, there's you know, the recent discoveries, uh, that is seeing the, uh, you know, the, the different wavelengths of the emission of different atoms. You know, they, they, they said, uh, uh, so they had the idea of, uh, well, uh, you know, they, well, you can read it here, but, atoms such as hydrogen or, so, uh, or sodium, um, which are relatively available in, in nearly infinite numbers. Uh, they're alike in every physical property. So this is what I was saying. They're absolutely identical. So they had that idea. And so they were actually thinking about the, the when they say vibration of sodium particles, this was actually optical oscillations that we were thinking about. So the basic idea here has been for uh, been around for an extremely long time, and of course, it's the technology that had to catch up to be able to realize this this uh, th this idea. Actually, one interesting thing in this same paragraph, they say uh, it, it, this 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 oscillation of these modes is known to be absolute independent of its position in the universe, and they can be excused because this was before Einstein came along and said no, that time is not the rate of time is not absolute. Uh, 
But anyway, the, the, they certainly had the basic idea many, many years ago. So anyway, uh, after, I, after my graduate career, I came uh, to the University of Washington and I, I worked with Hans Demel and uh, uh, his main interest, I was mostly attracted by, he had, uh, I'll say this in a minute, but anyway, he, had, he and his colleagues had, had done spectroscopy uh, on, it was helium ions, and I was interested by that and potentially the application of atomic clocks. But anyway, Hans wanted to focus on, on uh, experiment to measure the, the electron magnetic moment and the, the the basic idea there is an electron in addition to its charge has the property that be behaves also like a little magnet. And the, the reason this experiment was so important was that the, the, that the, 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 uh, the theory of uh, quantum electrodynamics can predict the value of this magnetic moment to a precision of about, uh, uncertainty of about a part in 10 to the 12th. And so the, this experiment was very important because eventually it was able to measure this, this precision to about that level. And uh, that's a whole separate story, but anyway, uh, uh, that two things to say here is that, uh, that uh, actually Bob Van Dyck, who is in the front row down here, was the, the person that actually led the experiment starting at the time I was here. And I actually, I didn't stay around for the actual important measurements. So these first very precise measurements were done by Bob Van Dyck and, and other colleagues here at, at University of Washington. Another thing to say is that because Helm Hans was developing t these techniques to confine, in this case, electrons and previously the, uh, the uh, ions, uh, he shared the Nobel Prize with, with Wolfgang Powell, who invented a slightly different kind of Ion trap, we say that that was uh, was that we actually use for our clock experiments, and I won't say anything very much about the these actually how the trap works. You can see this electrode structure uh, that I've drawn in cartoon form that looks pretty much like this for the non uh, uh, technical people in the audience. It, the, a very simple analogy is it's like the, this. When we apply electric fields to this uh, to this electrode structure, we create for the for a single ion, say in the trap, it's like a marble in a bowl. We create a so-called harmonic potential. But this analogy to a marble in a bowl that rolls back and forth is actually very good. So the other thing was that I mentioned that I was attracted uh, earlier on, actually, Hans and his colleagues. One being Norval Fortson, who was uh, a postdoc before my time. He was actually a Ramsey student be before my time too, but he came to work for Hans and they, they were measuring the, the same kind of so-called hyperfine structure in helium. And this was a, this, the, the, experiment, the resolution was very high. So this in some sense, people gave the ideas and I was certainly interested in how these ideas might be applied for atomic clocks. Uh, so let me, what I'm going to show here is one, focus on one experiment we've done in our lab. And I, I have to say, and I'll, I'll repeat it later, that, that this kind of work goes on in many labs throughout the, the world. And I'm going to focus on just this example of how we used a, a mercury ion to, to realize an atomic clock. And I should also say we, we did many different kinds of experiments with these ions, and, but this project here, and making a frequency standard out of out of the mercury ion, was was led by Jim Berquist in our group. So I've been, been a colleague of Jim for for the last 42 years, and so we've done a lot of things together. Anyway, so the basic idea here is again coming back to the simple picture I, I mentioned before: is that basically we start the atom in the ground state, and uh, then we apply radiation. Uh, and, and during this, uh, for a short amount of time. And then the idea is we measure uh, whether the ion has made the transition up to the excited state, and we look for the, con the condition where it does with the frequency of the, of the laser where, we, where it makes that transition with highest probability. Uh, this transition is actually in the ultraviolet, which is a bit of a technical problem, but we can make radiation at that frequency.
Anyway, the, the, the idea, uh, one of the issues is how do we, do, how do we detect when the, this atom has made the transition? So, uh, well, let me first say, why do, why, the, these experiments we've done for quite a while have been just with a single atomic ion in the trap. And so why do we focus on, on one ion? And there's one reason with mercury. It turns out the upper level in the mercury uh, ion it, it kind of has a, the shape of the electron cloud around it is kind of like a football. And it turns out that the electric, the inhomogeneous electric fields on one ion, as seen by the other ion, uh, in, interact with this football shape charge distribution and can give a frequency shift. And it's actually, it's fairly large compared to the resolution we're trying to achieve. So that's one of the reason, at least our experiments, mostly up till now, have, have used just one uh, single ion. In any case, uh, the way we detect is to look at uh, another transition, and this one I, I should have I should have mentioned here. The lifetime of the upper state in in uh, in this mercury ion for this clock transition is about a tenth of a second, which gives us very high resolution we can achieve. So the way we detect our ions is we we we. we or at least, first of all, to even identify that they're in the trap, is we use another transition uh, in, in uh, mercury. And this one can scatter photons at a very, very high rate on the order, almost on the several hundred megahertz uh, per uh, scatter rate. And uh, the nice thing about that is we can not only identify atoms, and in fact, in these experiments, we can, uh, we, with a, with a, camera that works in the ultraviolet, we can actually make pictures of our single ions. And actually, um, uh, Damilton and his colleagues, this was after I left, but they, they also were working on single ion experiments. And most of the ions, because there's one electron removed to be able to excite the next electron, the transitions are out of the visible spectrum in the ultraviolet. But there's a couple Ions, and one of those is barium, and so Damilton and his colleagues, they, they, they actually made fluorescence of a, uh, or could see it make an experiment like this, and uh, the, the light that was scattered was in the blue part of the spectrum, but in these experiments, you can actually see with your eye a single, single atom, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. It kind of looks like a faint star, but you can actually see it with your, with your eye. Uh, so one of, the, one of the issues we had to think about is that, in fact, in the early experiments on, on helium that I described that had been done by Norval Fortson and, and Damalt and their colleagues, was that uh, the atoms were, were actually moving fairly quickly in this, bouncing around fairly quickly inside this trap. And so they, one of the limitations was this time dilation shift that Einstein told us about. So th one of the messages from that was it'd be nice to have a way to slow down the, to the, the, ion, the motion of the ions to, to cool them, basically. And this was, again, to suppress this time dilation of, effect. So the way this cool, the simple, simple form of laser cooling works is the following. And this, uh, and actually, when, it, when I was here as a, as a, as a postdoc with Dave Motherway, we had this, we published a little paper on how this, this would work, and at the same time, independently, uh, two, two colleagues, uh, Ted Hench and Art Schello, who later also won Nobel Prizes. Anyway, they, we, we, we had the, basically the same idea. And the idea, uh, if, you'll, if you'll bear with me a little bit, it, it, it's not too complicated. And the, uh, the basic idea is that I've, I've already told you that atoms, uh, rather than the energy of, say, the electrons, after, rather than existing in a continuous uh, spectrum of energy states, they're, they're confined, to, the energy is confined to discrete energies. So that's a key part of this. And then, as I said, when, just for a clock, I've kind of, I haven't said much about the motion, but if the atoms are absorbed, then they, then the, when the laser is tuned to this uh, so-called resonance frequency given by the energy difference, uh, then they, they absorb maximally at that, uh, at that condition. Now, of course, what we have to think about is in general, even though the atoms are confined in this trap, we say that they're moving, they're moving around, say, with some, some amount of kinetic energy. And the idea is that 
if the atom is, say, moving against the laser beam, uh, one thing we have to worry about is the so-called first-order Doppler shift. And the common example of that, that we all experience is if, it, say, in my day, the example was a train that would go by you and the, the, uh, the, the train whistle as it approached you would be higher pitched than it was receding from you. And of course, the same fact with a car going by or a motorcycle going by, that you hear this change in the pitch of the sound and the same idea applies to light. So the idea here is that when the atom is moving against this, this the, the, the photons from this laser beam, uh, they actually absorb, but not the frequency absorb at with their rest, but it's, but the frequency they absorb at is shifted by, uh, the, by the velocity divided by the speed of light. And we can take advantage of that because the idea is then what we do is we, uh, we, we a laser comes in from this side and uh, we tune the frequency lower than the frequency it would absorb at at rest. And the idea is when it, then when the atoms move into this resonance condition here, the, the, the atoms will absorb the light. And when they absorb the photon, they get a momentum kick, which in this case is against their motion. And then when they re-radiate, generally they do it in all directions. So on average, every, every time they absorb and, and re-emit a photon, they, the, the momentum is reduced uh, uh, by the momentum of the photon. And so we can repeat this process, do many scattering events, which gives the slowing process, uh, which allows us to cool the atoms down. Uh, and so that, okay, that's what I just said. And so this, this has become a, a standard technique now in, in all atomic clocks, because the precisions are high enough that if the atoms are at room temperature, uh, we, the, the shift is just too big from this time dilation effect, so we have to, we have to invoke this cooling idea. So anyway, when I, I did a little bit of uh, personal history is that that uh, when I after uh, my postdoc position in in Damont's lab, the, I, I I I got a position at the what was then called the National Bureau of Standards, now called this then. National Institute of Standards and Technology. And my first job there when I, when I went there was uh, there was a cesium beam clock. That's, that's what this is here. Basically, atom, cesium atoms are made to go travel down this tube, which, which has a vacuum, and that make a stream of atom, uh, cesium atoms. And when they go down this tube, we measure the radiation of this so-called hyperfine transition. But anyway, it, uh, my, my group leader at that time, the, the person that hired me, uh, had a vision for NIST that we should be doing more research. So, so luckily, he got us some money to, uh, to try this idea of laser cooling. And sort of an interesting personal aside was the fact that uh, so uh, during, after Damold and I had this idea, and Damold had taken a sabbatical, it was actually I left, and he went to work and in uh, Peter Toshek's lab, he was then in Heidelberg, and I, I knew they were going to try to demonstrate this cooling. And but we got some money uh, to at NIST to to try this experiment. And so I, they they didn't know about our experiment, but I knew they were trying to do this. Was so we were racing at least. And and uh, so what what's interesting is basically without you know without any I knew they were working on, it, but I had no idea where, where they were in terms of their progress. But interesting, the papers on this first, these first demonstrations were, were published about the same time. You can see that ours was published a little bit earlier. But to be fair, if you look at the dates these were received at the, at the journal, they, they beat us by one day. <laughs> so, so anyway, as, as, as most of you know, I think, I mean, these experiments are, are relatively long term, and if you do it within a few months of each other, it's certainly a tie. So anyway, uh, both bo both groups got credit for doing this at the at the same time. But it, but, but there's sort of amazing near coincidence here. Um, so okay, I'll say a little bit more about this. So I, I have already alluded to this. So for this mercury ion optical clock, we're going to use this transition here in the ultraviolet at about 282 nanometers. Uh, and uh, how do we measure the transition? So one way we describe this process, again, we start the atom in the ground state, we apply this radiation for a little while, 
And then we, we make what's called a superposition state. So the, the atom is, is I, this is kind of a, a standard notation for wave functions, but the wave function in this case, after that we apply this radiation, is that the atom is in, we say, a superposition of the lower state and the first excited state. And the one nice thing, we have a very good way of measuring when the atom makes the transition, and it's basically, the, 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 it's the idea of the following. When we turn on the, this other laser, then we, we tend to, this superposition state that we made, it can, it can, we say, collapse into either the ground state or the excited state, and it does it with a, uh, with a probability get, that's related to these coefficients in, in front of this, these components of the wave function. But the key idea is that uh, when the atom, if we suppose we, 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 drive, we try to drive this transition, and suppose that the, the, reson, or the frequency of the laser is a bit off, then the atom remains in the ground state. And we can tell when that happens because then when we turn on this laser here, we're gonna see scattering like at the picture I showed and we can pick a bit of that up in a, in a say a photomultiplier, some, some detector. Uh, on the other hand, if we're, we're close to resonance then there's a high probability when we turn on this, <coughs> pardon me, this laser here, that the atom will actually be collapse into the upper state and when that happens, the we don't see any scattered light when we turn on this laser here. So the, the, the nice thing is, is that we can easily discriminate which, which state the atom has been detected in. So for example, this, this shows this data here is, uh, we were causing transitions, but the, you know, each, each, each uh, the, the data that we took, we would average the fluorescence for about a millisecond, but you can easy, easily see that if we put a discriminator here, we can tell with essentially 100% efficiency, efficiency what level the atom is, is measured to be in. Uh, so so I, there's a lot of details in this, that, but anyway, some of the interesting ones uh, uh, in, this, in this mercury ion experiment was uh, basically we, this, the electrode structure I showed in cartoon form, it's a little hard to see here, but that's this, this same structure that I, I showed in the cartoon. Uh, in this case, uh, one, of the, one of the unfortunate things is that with mercury, the way we would, would create the ions is we'd just leak in a little bit of mercury vapor. And then we'd, in those days, we had a very crude experiment. We would just, we would make a, crude electron beam with a make our homemade filament and stream electrons through the through the that ring electrode in the trap and then when atoms when the neutral mercury atoms were inside occasionally one would be ionized by this electron beam and when that would happen the the the, the ion would be trapped uh, but one of the problems we had was that it turns out mercury if you leak it into a, a metal vacuum system, which you can see that this is uh, the container without the lid, is that the, the, the mercury, it turns out, it, when you leak it into a, a vacuum system like that, it, it's, what it does is it amalgamates with, with uh, copper. And, but on the other, so what it has, it basically diffuses into the copper. But the problem is there's always, even if we try to pump all the mercury away, the, vac, uh, the mercury is effusing out of the uh, the vacuum and the problem that made was it turns out that when the mercury ions were in the excited state, if they were, if they collided with a neutral mercury atom in the background, they would radiatively associate, we say, and it would make a mercury molecule, a, a dimer, a, a two atom molecule, and basically that was the end of our atomic uh, ion qubits or ion uh, for the clock, and so. It was a, it was a hor and it was just a horribly annoying problem because we'd get all the lasers tuned up and and then after ten minutes this this collision process would happen and we'd have to reload the ion and tune everything up again. So so basically we just hit it with a sludge hammer and that is we would we put our ion trap in it in its enclosure we attached it to a liquid helium reservoir. And basically it, uh, the, the liquid helium temperature under normal conditions is at about four Kelvin absolute. So basically everything freezes out uh, except for maybe some helium, but helium's not a problem. 
So, so literally, we went from storage times, we could keep the ion earlier for only about 10 minutes, and we went for, we could literally increase the, the lifetime to about 10, six months, and that was just due to that we'd do something stu stupid, which would kick the ion out. Uh, but there's other advantages to going to, to low temperature. One is that we, I've already alluded to, we basically freeze out most most of the background gas, so the collisions are almost reduced to nothing. Another subtle thing is that, that, that it turns out the clocks are perturbed by thermal radiation, so-called black body radiation. And I was always, you know, when we first thinking about this, the, it turns out the, the thermal radiation in the room, the, the electric fields due to that radiation are, are not insignificant. They're about 10 volts per centimeter, so they're actually, fairly strong fields and we're all bathed in this, in this radiation. Anyway, this radiation could shift the frequency of the clock and so it'd be nice to, to reduce that and one way to do it is to, to put an atom in a very cold, uh, at a very cold temperature. Okay, so there's other issues. Now the way I mentioned that the, the absorption uh, range of this mercury ion, it would be about one hertz, one cycle per second wide out of about a million billion cycles per second. So it gave very high resolution, but one of the problems we had going into this, everybody had, was the laser, although we knew how this should work, the lasers were not stable enough. In other words, the wavelength, the, 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 the frequency and wavelength of the radiation would fluctuate around. So the standard technique that, that people use for many decades, and it's still the way people do these experiments, is basically, we form a, a resonant cavity with two mirrors, and what we do is we shine our laser radiation in there, and I, 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 for, the, for the physics students here, they, they know this problem is basically the, the, the cavity will only transmit, will build up radiation and only transmit radiation through when there's a, an, an integer number of half wavelengths of this radiation uh, given by the distance between the uh, that fit inside the distance uh, spanned by these two, the, these two mirrors. And so basically we can, although you know, there's many frequencies that can happen, we basically stabilize our lasers to one of these transmission conditions, and then, we, and then the, the stability is governed just by how well we can control the distance between the, the mirrors. And actually this has a lot of similarities. We, you know, this last year with the big splash was the, the, in the last year or two was the, to be able to detect gravity waves uh, by looking at the oscillations of these mirrors. And we're not nearly as sensitive as those, as those instruments, but the, the, the idea is very much the same. We can, we can stabilize our lasers as long as these, the spacing between these mirrors is, is very precise. So anyway, uh, uh, Jim Berkowitz and I had the idea, a very simple idea to get rid of mechanical vibrations as he basically supported this, what this cartoon is meant to show. Here's one mirror, the other mirror is hidden, but there's a glass spacer here that's very rigid and provides the, a rigid distance between the, the ends of these mirrors. One thing, I, again, it's, not, it's no comparison to the sensitivity of the, of the gravity wave detectors, but what I always, what I always found interesting was that uh, when we set this down on the on the floor to tune up the optics on the on the small optical table, is you'd we'd always see some some noise very close to the center frequency where the where the where the the laser would be locked to this to this uh, resonance given by the spacing, and we always see some noise on the side at much less than a hertz, about a seventh of a hertz, and that turns out to be the the, the waves crashing on the beach in California that gives this, this, uh, this broad sort of noise spectrum at one seventh of a hertz. Anyway, the state of the art these days, we're still bothered by vibration is, and this is, this, we we're now affected by the same things that, that, that in part limit the detection sensitivity of the gravity wave detectors. That we still have to worry about mechanical vibrations, but what it comes down to now is, we have to do have to worry about the spacing of the mirrors, but the, the main thing we're left with is actually the coatings on the mirrors that give the reflectivity. 
There are also mechanical systems. They vibrate and they give some noise, which limits the, how well we can stabilize, in our case, the, the lasers to this cavity. Okay, well, coming back, I'm just going to summarize the very many years of work. And uh, first of all, the, 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 you know, the, the fact that we're trapping the ions, on average, the, the, their, their average velocity is zero, so we get rid of what's called this first-order Doppler effect. And what we call the second-order Doppler shift or time dilation is, is, is suppressed highly by, by this idea of laser cooling. And we, we, I, I've already mentioned we su suppress a, several other effects by going to low temperature in this apparatus. So the one thing that, 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 that we felt proud about, and it's mainly due to Jim Berkowitz, was that this, uh, we had been chasing the, 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 the performance of cesium for decades. And so in, in the, about 2006, then, this was the first clock that could demonstrate that an optical clock was actually better in terms of performance than the, than the cesium clocks. And so, so nowadays, uh, all the, all the standards labs, for sure, that it, we, we've, we've all gone to optical clocks. Some of the other ions that people are using, we're actually using aluminum these days, is a bit better performance than, than mercury, but there's many choices. Uh, and of course, there's many neutral atom choices. One of the interesting possibilities that people are looking towards is the, the uh, thorium nucleus uh, is, uh, it has a nuclear transition, which by coincidence, there's, there are energy levels which are separated by close to an optical transition. And as time evolves, it appears it's pretty far in the ultraviolet, but nevertheless, this is an interesting idea, rather than using atomic transitions, to be able to use nuclear transitions. So, so let me just come back to these so-called systematic effects, the environmental effects that cause frequency shifts. I, I've told you about the, the first order Doppler shift where we, because the atom is trapped, its velocity goes to zero. And then there's this so-called time dilation uh, or second order Doppler shift. Now I lied to you a little bit. The, uh, although the atom is trapped and it's true that its, its average velocity goes to zero, uh, one thing we have to worry about is that the laser will, we have an optical table that the laser sits on, and then our trap is, say, at the other end of the optical table. And what we have to worry about is that the temperature in the lab changes, the, the table is shrinking and, and contracting a little bit. And with the velocities we're sensitive to at the level of precision we're at now are about three tenths of a nanometer per second. So we have to stabilize the distance between the laser and the, and the, and the clock in this, the clock atom in this, in this trap. And what we do there is we actually borrowed a technique from satellite ranging uh, where basically the, the satellite ranging is done by sending a signal out, reflecting it off, effectively reflecting it off the satellite. And the, 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 the signal that comes back is shifted by the Doppler shift by basically twice the first order Doppler shift. And, and from that, we can measure the velocity in that case of the spacecraft. We do the same thing here, only the velocities are quite a bit smaller than the velocity of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a satellite, or, or rather, in this case, a deep space probe that's uh, uh, but anyway, we use exactly the same technique to get to subtract out this, this Doppler shift. Now I've all, and I've also talked about the, 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 the time dilation shift, uh, this famous so-called twin paradox by Einstein, and we suppress that with laser cooling. There's another effect, which is also, well, anyway, so the net result of our experiment so far is we're down to a, real, a fractional precision, which is how we characterize all the clocks, because we can doing it that way, it's only the, 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 the real measure of the performance is the relative precision. So we're down to a level of about eight parts in 10 to the 18 with these experiments. So one of the effects we have to worry about is the so-called, again due to Einstein, the so-called gravitational potential redshift. And in addition to the time dilation shift due to movement of the ions, Einstein also showed us that, that, that clocks run at different rates in different gravitational potentials. And so 
uh, one, one example I can give you is that, that suppose you had a twin brother or sister and you were separated at birth and suppose your twin lived in Boulder, Colorado, where we are about a mile uh, above sea level and, you're, you're, and you lived at, at sea level. It turns out that there, there is an effect, but it's nothing uh, to really worry about too much. In fact, it's after 80 years, your, your twin will be about a, a millisecond older than, than, you are, than you are due to this potential. So it's a very small effect. Nevertheless, uh, we can see this effect. So kind of as a more of a stunt, but a kind of a fun thing to do is to demonstrate this effect on a kind of a, a more, uh, you know, everyday scale. So this is, uh, so just to kind of show this effect, this is our, uh, our optical clock. This one is based on aluminum, but the principles are very much the same of what I described for mercury. And so obviously this is not the one you wear on your wrist yet, but, but nevertheless, we, we, we made a, a, a clock like this in one lab in an adjacent lab, we had another uh, clock with, based on aluminum, which, as far as we could tell, was identical. Anyway, we measured the, the ratio of the frequencies of those two clocks, uh, and, it, and it was about out here to, I forget how many, on the order of 17 digits anyway, that we could, that they were running at the same frequency. And then just as a, as a demonstration, we, we uh, uh, James Chow, who was running this experiment, is basically you can see he's put some jacks into the table here and he raises the 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 table up by about about a foot 33 centimeters and we could actually see that we could resolve this 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 so-called gravitational potential redshift so the the precisions now are such that we do have to worry about these very small effects including this gravitational potential redshift so what's the where are we at these days? So uh, I, I showed the number we achieved, this fractional precision that is taking account of all the environmental effects. So we, we, we actually had the lead for a few years, but now there's many other, there's always been many other groups working on that. And so, so these results have been superseded more recently by, first of all, we had some colleagues in the, basically the German version of the, of NIST where they've made a clock based on deuterium ions and the precision in their clock is a little more than a factor of two smaller than in ours. The other thing I haven't talked about, but it's important is that I've been talking about single ions and we, for the reason I mentioned, but we do want to scale up the number to larger numbers and it's simply we get, we get more signal with more ions and so we can improve our the time it takes to reach a measurement precision. So, so we're making, you know, we're making traps that don't look the same, but basically we make strings of ions and therefore increase the, the numbers that we can play with. And so, and also the, uh, there's been a number of ad, uh, experiments done with neutral atoms, and uh, they 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 don't use the same kind of traps, but they're able to make traps by by using laser beams and kind of a, a, a cartoon version in two dimensions. It's kind of like a, a, a egg crate that can hold individual atoms and they can do this in three dimensions. And so this, this work first started, the first high precision measurements were done by a group uh, uh, of Katori in Japan, but the, the leader in more, recent, more recent years has been Jun Yi in, in the group at Jilla. And they're down now to a where the, the, the so-called systematic precision is down about four times lower than, than we're able to do. And the other thing is they can hold quite a, a number of, large number, a few thousand atoms in their so-called egg, egg crate structure. So they can much more quickly reach a high precision than we can with our, with our single line. So we, we have some catching up to do now. But anyway, the, so the best precisions are very close to a part in 10 to the 18th. And just a, another thing to compare back to this gravitational potential redshift, the, 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 the shift due to this gravitational potential redshift is about one part in 10 to the 18 for a centimeter uh, rise in position. So we're getting down to these very uh, sensitive values. Actually, coming back to this, one problem we have is the, 
that if we can, because of this gravitational potential redshift, one of the problems we have is that in order to compare two clocks, the problem is we can make, make measurement comparisons between clocks, say one at sea level and one in Boulder, Colorado. The problem is we don't, we're limited in precision because we don't know the, the, the height of Boulder in terms of this gravitational uh, potential redshift to about, only about 30 centimeters. So in fact, with these higher precisions, we're limited in precision simply because we don't know the gravitational potential redshift between sea level and, and boulders. So the only way we can make precise uh, comparisons of these really accurate clocks is we have to bring them together when we know they're in the same gravitational potential. So this is kind of a headache, right? But uh, of course, we tried to take the high road, and so one one view is to take these very, in the future is to take these very accurate clocks and be able to map what's called the geoid, the gravitational potential around the, around the Earth. And I've just mentioned some of the groups, there's many more around the world working both on ions and neutral atoms pursuing these ideas. So what's the future? Uh, and so navigation is still one of the main applications. The other is in in synchronization, so for example, in network synchronization, timing signals, you, we need these higher and higher precisions. But nevertheless, we still continue to think about navigation. So at the at the centimeter scale, you think, well, who who really cares? And and one application that people talk about is that, for example, a precursor to to earthquakes is 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 usually. Uh, uh, an earthquake is preceded by strain in the earth, meaning uh, two relative lo locations that might be separated by kilometers. They're gonna, they're, they're, their relative height compared to the center of the earth will change uh, and this strain and eventually the, the strain will cause, a, uh, you know, the, the, the earth to let go there'll be, and they'll readjust. And so this, this measuring this strain at this perhaps centimeter level can be a, not maybe not a predictor, but a, it, it can be it can be a signal that that, that an earthquake is is building uh, building up, or uh, the probability of an earthquake is increasing. And so we 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 think about doing this. And I already mentioned this idea of, of mapping the gravitational potential redshift around the world. There's also a bunch of fun things we can think about doing. And one of the interesting things is if we take if we take clocks that are made on different elements, it turns out that they, the, the frequencies that they run at uh, in general depend on, on, on different ratios of the fundamental forces, say the strong, so-called strong nuclear forces and electromagnetic forces, which uh, they, they, the ratios of the contributions of the frequencies, different, uh, different uh, basic forces will vary. And so if we measure, if we try to, if we measure the frequency ratio of clocks based on two different elements over time, one of the interesting things to think about is that are the fundamental constants, quotes, the, that govern the frequency of these transitions, are they changing in time? So uh, we've been able to put uh, uh, limits on that and there's, this continues on. We, there's, there's still a lot of motivation to do that. We're always, as a, a popular game, we're always trying to see deviations of Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, and so far he's, he's doing just fine, but nevertheless, we still try to probe with higher accuracy to see whether there might be variations. And so with that, I'd like to thank our, uh, the, the real people doing the group. This is just our group working on these experiments. Uh, and there's many groups around the world uh, working on these problems. I'd like want to also acknowledge our, our laboratory director, Catherine Gebby, who was laboratory director, meaning the larger group of, of divisions, that, like the time and frequency division. And uh, she was very supportive of some of these basic ideas. For example, this idea of laser cooling was, I mean, we just wanted to do it because it would be kind of nifty to demonstrate this effect. but but it became very important for clocks. And in fact, it's, it's used in all high accuracy clocks. And she was very supportive of this kind of exploratory work. Unfortunately, she passed away a year or so ago. And uh, 
but nevertheless, she made a great environment for us. And uh, I'm going to, for those who might know a few people there, I'm going to list people. Actually, how, what, how much time? Uh... Not much. <laughs> <laughs> so just, I, I mean, often, I, I, maybe you've seen these things before, but, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a little bit about the Nobel Prize here. So, so I think um, I, most of you know that, oops, the... The prize is, oh, I'll find that later, I hope. <laughs> anyway, the, the prize is announced in, in around October 10th or so. And uh, I, mean, it's, I mean, the whole thing is very surreal because it, you know, it is, <laughs> it gets so much attention. Uh, but anyway, so they, they announced the prize in early October. And then the ceremony is actually coming up within days here. I think it's on the 10th of December, anyway. Uh, on the uh, on the date of, of uh, Nobel's death, and uh, anyway, so we but the you know we go there in, uh, in early December, and this is a, a what's nice. I mean, Stockholm is a very charming city, and actually even during the dead of winter here, you can see the snow on the ground. It was very cold, but they have these open uh, open air markets, and so. Uh, I mean, it, it really, they, they do a Christmas in a very charming way, I must say. But anyway, uh, actually, one thing about this figure, so we get to spend time wandering around a little bit. And one interesting thing about this figure, I mean, Sweden's pretty far north, so this picture was at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and you can see the sun is already set. <laughs> so it's getting, getting pretty dark uh, pretty early there. So anyway, so the, the, everything is just way over the top, all these ceremonies. And so this was the award ceremony uh, uh, and the, 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 the laureates over several disciplines were all lined up in this first row here. And here's the royal family. And so basically the way the ceremony uh, goes is each person, a little, little bit is said about the person and, the, and they walk up and receive the, uh, the award from the, from the king. And, so you can see we're all, we all, everything is very well organized. We have a rigid uniform. And part of that uniform for us was that uh, we had, of course, had to wear tuxedos, but also we had to wear patent leather shoes. And, the, and these patent leather shoes were, this was a, a, you know, a firm carpet, but walking on this carpet is like working, walking on ice. And the whole time when I was going up to receive my award, I said, just don't fall. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I made it through okay. This is me receiving the, the award from the king. And uh, anyway, after this very fancy ceremony, the, the royal family had a few people over for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and all this is, I mean, it's just, everything is so much over the top. Actually, one thing I didn't know, Nobel, um, uh, b before going there, is Nobel actually favored the physicists out of the chemists and, and, and the other disciplines. And so uh, and we were the ones that got to sit with the members of the royal family, you know, at, at, at these different events, uh, which was somewhere here in the, in the middle of this table. The other thing to say is that, that, that uh, there's about, I forget about, I think it was like 1,200 people here. And so what you, what you learn is that uh, the, the Nobel laureates and their guests were, unfortunately, were only, we, you know, at these fancy official events, we could only, each laureate could only invite 12 people. And there were, I think, eight of us, I know I'm forgetting, eight of us that year uh, to receive the prize in these different disciplines. And so that's about 100 guests. And so there was about 1,400 people at this thing. And what you, what you learn is that, that this is a big deal for not only Swedish society, but officialdom, you know, it, it's a big deal to be, to go to this event. And, they, and, and it's also nice, they invite some students from the, from the local universities, but anyway, it's this very fancy thing. And uh, so, and, and the, 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 the dinner there is, you know, it's like, it's extremely <laughs> well organized. So there was one of these, one of these guys here was like a, like an orchestra conductor. So that, you know, there was, I don't know, 100 or more 
uh, servers and they each would serve a few people, but he would wave his wand and you know, everything would be done in, in, synch in synchrony. And uh, anyway, it was, it, you know, it was just, as I say, a very, it was really a surreal thing, but of course very, very fun. And I think, uh, so one of the nice things was that, that the person I shared the award with was Serge Roche from whose lab, he's, his lab is in Paris. And I'd gotten in, to know Serge, oh gosh, 35 years ago. I first knew him through the literature because he, he done some nice work. And then I got to know him about, you know, personally about 25 or 30 years ago. And our, uh, gradually our, our, our wives became friends as well. So it was a great, you know, pleasure to share with him. And I think we, we both feel the same way that, and I think most, laureates do that you know the the one thing to say is that the probability of receiving this award extremely small and i think we both feel we were we were lucky to have it happen but <clears throat> there's many qualified people and 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 we more feel like we represented our field rather than our individual accomplishment but nevertheless it was a great like, you know real thrill for us to to share with my my friend Serge. so Anyway, with that, I will stop for the final time. And this, of course, these are the people in our lab doing the work. Okay, although, uh, so thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Um, I think we have a time just for a couple of questions from, from the audience. Are there any questions? Come on up, there's a mic right here in the aisle, in both aisles. Hello, is this mic on? Okay, no? Yes, yes. okay. I was curious how you keep time on your person. On, on, on your person, <laughs> out and about, how do you, so I, how do you keep time? I have a watch here and it, it's good to about maybe two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so not very well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but probably more seriously, like all of you, I, I have my cell phone and, and <laughs> rely on that these days to give me a better time. But. So an, another easy question. Uh, when you lifted the table up and uh -huh. then moved it back down, did you get back to the same difference of zero <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it was reproducible within our precision you know actually I must say that this was you know it was a demonstration but the uh, there's been much more accurate demonstration of this gravitational potential redshift and I mentioned I, I gave a reference when we talked about you know measure compensating for the Doppler shift of, due to the expansion and contraction of our table the experiment I quoted there was one uh, where they, it was, a, it goes back, it, it had a rocket, which was suborbital, so this rocket went over, I forget where it was launched from, but, it, you know, went, went up in this arc and then crashed into the sea. But during this, I don't know, I forget, roughly an hour that it was in this orbit uh, or this trajectory, uh, of course, the gravitational potential changed significantly. Anyway, they were able to measure the gravitational potential redshift to about a part in 10 of the six, and ours was only this thing that I showed you was about, about 10, 10%, so just kind of give the, the basic idea. And so this, the, this rocket on board had a hydrogen maser, actually, and that was done quite a while ago, I think in the late 60s, and that's still the most accurate measurement of the gravitational potential redshift was this early experiment. Uh, that was done with a hydrogen maser. Um, I was wondering. Yes. Okay. Can't hear myself. What makes an atom a good candidate to be used for an atomic clock? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I, 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 you know, I, I mentioned this briefly, but I mentioned a lot of things. But again, the, the basic idea has to do with the fact that uh, 
all atoms of a, of a given kind, as far as we know, are exactly identical. So we have, you know, we have things that, that perturb the frequency, one being these, these esoteric things like the, the gravitational potential redshift. But if we bring, if we have two atoms that, that undergo the same environmental per perturbations, as far as we know, they should run at exactly the, the same frequency. And so, as I was trying to make the case there, that, for example, for a pendulum clock, we have to worry about these things like the pendulum, the length of the pendulum is, can vary in, in production. And, but th there isn't that difference with atoms. They're, as far as we know, they're exactly identical. So. I guess my question was, like, which element? Oh, I see. That, yeah, there's no simple answer. In fact, you, I mean, there's, I don't know how many, there's probably 25 different atoms or ions that, are, that people consider, and they all have advantages and different and, and disadvantages, and that some may be good for some reducing some environmental effect, and others are better for other reasons. So there's no, there's no big winners. So I, I would say there's nobody's come up with, you know, uh, an atom where this is the choice everybody should be using. One, one interesting sidelight about that, and what's amazing is that, you know, the cesium clock I mentioned was. First, developed, first demonstrated in the 50s, and then about the mid-60s, that it was decided it would become the, the standard for the length of time, the second. And what's amazing to me is that it was the best clock from basically the mid-60s till about 2006, where we did this optical clock experiment. So it's, I mean, it's just remarkable that it was the best choice for this very long Length of time, of course, you know. Of course, they would, you know, they were always working to improvement, so improve it. But still, it's, it's still, an, it was amazingly good choice. It was the best clock for that length of time. So. so it's getting late. So unfortunately, we'll have to, to end this evening. But I'd like to thank you all again for attending this lecture. Yeah. Thank you.